Every once in a while, you come across that one thing that ends up having a really big impact on you. It can be anything, really, a book or a movie or something as simple as a piece of artwork. Whatever the case, though, it ends up being something that exists in such a way that after the experience, it leaves a very unique impression on you, and it might even change how you look at other stuff similar to that thing. With the entertainment industry, it seems like it exists almost exclusively for stuff like this, media that wants to get your attention and leave a positive impression. It wants to make you a fan of it, but they can't all be winners. You're not going to become a fan of everything you experience, but on the flip side, it almost makes you appreciate even more what you are a fan of. And for me, one of those things is The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. Now on its own, Twilight Princess is a pretty big deal in the context of the overall Zelda series. At the time of its announcement, it was shown off as the next big Zelda game, the one that would live up to the monolithic reputation Ocarina of Time had left behind years prior. Of course, there had been a couple big titles between these two, but for one reason or another, they ended up going down different paths, not really trying to replicate what made Ocarina of Time such a masterpiece in many people's eyes. So to see a game that looked like a proper follow-up to the groundwork laid by Ocarina, yeah, people were pretty excited when the game was revealed. What I don't think anybody could have predicted at the time of that reveal was how Twilight Princess would end up standing out amongst other games in this series. And that might be a weird thing to say, especially if you're a Zelda fan, because pretty much every game in this series stands out on its own. And specifically, if you've actually played the game for yourself, Twilight Princess can be seen as another formulaic Zelda game. And after all, that's kind of what I've been saying it is, by regarding it as a follow-up to Ocarina of Time. There's definitely some merit to that argument, but in my opinion, Twilight Princess does far more to stand out amongst other entries in the series. And more than that, I see Twilight Princess as being more than just a spiritual successor to the original 3D Zelda. I see it as classic 3D Zelda perfected. That's a big statement, I'm aware, and to really show what I mean, we have to take a closer look at the actual game itself, because just like I explained with Super Mario Galaxy, I believe that what makes Twilight Princess special requires deeper insight into how exactly it presents itself and how it evolves the formula from its predecessor. It's not just a case of good controls or pretty graphics, although I'd be lying if I said that it didn't play just a little bit of an important role here. So go ahead and get comfortable, grab a fresh bottle of milk, and let's just see what it is that makes The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess so special. In the southern region of the Kingdom of Hyrule lies the Ordon Woods, and deeper within it, the small Ordon Village. It's a nice little place, there's only like 10 villagers total and the goats keep getting loose, but otherwise it's a pretty chill place, and it's here where we meet this game's incarnation of the series hero, Link. Here he's a simple ranch hand, helping out on the village farm, herding goats, and wrestling them when they try to get away. Well, he tries to at least. He's also pretty popular with the village children, being the kind of guy that a lot of them look up to, especially for one of them, this kid Colin. One evening, Colin's father, the local swordsman Russell, requests that Link make an important delivery to Hyrule Castle, where the ruler of the land, Princess Zelda, resides. But the delivery isn't for another day or two, and the first half hour or so of the game is really just Link going about his daily business in the village, fishing, hitting things with sticks, and hanging out with his pretty much but not really girlfriend, Ilya. Seriously though, this opening bit in the village takes a good long while to get through, especially on your first playthrough. The entire point is to show what life is like for Link and Ordon, and in that respect it gets the job done. Still though, it kinda sucks when replaying because it really takes a while for stuff to get going. Speaking of which, at one point a local monkey just kinda wanders into the village, and the children chase after it into the nearby Farron Woods. One of them ends up getting captured by the monsters in the woods, but Link easily rescues him and sends him home, right before Russell shows up, commenting on the dangerous increase of monsters in the woods lately. So yeah, that was a thing. The next morning is the day Link is set to make the delivery to Hyrule Castle, stopping to talk to Ilya before leaving. Ilya notices Link's horse is slightly wounded, and although completely aware that Link is on a schedule, she basically takes his horse away from him to the nearby spring to heal her up. You know, Ilya, I get you're concerned and all, but I'm really starting to not like you. Link and Colin chase her down and convince her to give Link's horse back, where she in turn asks that he promise to come home safe from his journey and not do anything out of his league. Don't worry, Ilya. I'm sure everything will be just fine.
Link soon wakes up and chases after the monsters into Farron Woods, but is quickly stopped by a massive wall of darkness blocking his path. Something pulls him in anyways, and once inside, Link really starts to freak out. Like, chill dude, it's not that bad in here. Okay, I feel like that's a bit of an overreaction, but whatever. Link is dragged away and wakes up in what seems to be a dungeon of some kind, and it looks like he's all alone in his new form until... This right here is Midna, a small imp-like creature with a very weird taste in headwear. She taunts Link in his new wolf form for a while, but agrees to help him escape wherever he is, on the condition that they go and meet a specific person afterwards. So the two team up for now as Midna guides Link out of his cell and through some dank sewers. On the way, they come across a few of these spirit-looking things, all of which take the shape of soldiers. Okay, interesting. They climb out of the sewers and arrive at- <laughs> Whoa, okay. I guess we made it to Hyrule Castle after all. Still doesn't explain why we're here though, but Minna tells Link to head to one of the castle towers where inside they meet this person. And hey, look, it's Princess Zelda. Yeah, she's in this game. Who'd have guessed? So Zelda basically explains what's going on here. One nice and sunny day, the peaceful kingdom of Hyrule was invaded by an army of dark monsters led by this guy, self-proclaimed King of the Twilight, Zant. Zant's forces quickly overpowered Zelda's, essentially forcing the princess to surrender to him, allowing the king to envelop all of Hyrule in a thick veil of twilight. Zelda explains that Zant has overrun Hyrule with the dark power of twilight, and unless he stops soon, the entire kingdom, and eventually the entire world, will be trapped in a state of perpetual twilight, completely under the control of the evil king. And Link, as the hero chosen by the gods, is the only one with the power to stop him. Link and Minna are forced to leave Zelda for the time being, and despite Link now knowing what's at stake here, the good of the kingdom doesn't really seem to be his primary concern right now, as Minna gleefully reminds him. Minna warps Link back to the twilight-covered Farron Woods, where after some preparation, they begin looking for a way to dispel the twilight. This leads them to helping out the forest light spirit, searching the woods for its lost pieces of light that were scattered by the twilight monsters. They find them all, and the light spirit gets rid of the twilight, returning Farron Woods to normal. Link also gets returned to normal, and now with a spiffy new set of clothes. The Light Spirit explains that in order to defeat Zan, they need to locate an ancient relic in the local forest temple, as its ancient power is apparently of great importance. So Link heads over to the forest temple, and after fighting his way through, finds that relic, which Minna explains is something called a fused shadow. Turns out though that this isn't the only thing they need, as spread across Hyrule are two more fused shadows that the two need to defeat Zant. And that's basically our setup for this leg of the journey. Link and Minna now need to travel across Hyrule, locate the other two fused shadows, dispel the twilight covering the kingdom, and maybe find Link's missing friends along the way. I'm sorry for how much setup I've just exposited, but there really is a lot going on in this early chapter of the game, and it really does take a while to get through. Like seriously, even if you know exactly where you're going, it can take a good couple of hours before you even get to the forest temple. The point of this first area is to set up a lot of what's going to be important later on, not just with the story, but also how Link operates both in his human and wolf forms, and how things are going to be playing out for a while after this. And this isn't really anything new. For a story like this, it's important to show how the main character's normal life is before throwing them into the main conflict, and from a game perspective, you need to introduce how exactly the player is going to be handling that main character. What makes this more interesting is how previous games, especially Ocarina of Time, did pretty much the same thing, just in a way shorter amount of time. But let's just put a pin in that for a while, because right now, it's about time we get out of these damn woods. So to find the other two fused shadows, Link and Midna need to head to the other two regions of Hyrule currently enveloped in twilight. The Elden region, made up of the hidden Kakariko village and volcanic Death Mountain, and then the Lanayru region, comprising the massive Lake Hylia, the aquatic Zora's Domain, and Hyrule Castle Town. 
Both of these regions pretty much have a similar way of going through them. The first thing Link has to do with both of them is locate their respective light spirits and gather their scattered light, in turn dispelling the twilight. After that, it's just a matter of finding each region's temple and going through it, collecting the fused shadow inside. But what makes both regions different is what exactly Link does to get to these endpoints, or to be more specific, the people he interacts with. Let's start with Elden. Okay, so to find the light spirit fragments in this area, you have to go into this one building in Kakariko Village, and inside Link finds not just Colin, but all the other children that were kidnapped from Ordon as well, which, gotta say, is massively convenient. Problem is, in this universe, the oppressive nature of the Twilight has affected everyone in it, relegating them to these spirit forms. That's why they look all blue. Now, to them, it doesn't really affect them that much. In fact, they don't even realize that they're spirits. Because Link is the chosen hero, he's protected from the Twilight, and as such is the only one to not become a spirit. So while he can see them, none of the spirits can actually see him. Kind of a cruel twist of fate there. But anyways, after getting rid of this region's twilight, Link is finally reunited with the children, who are all pretty happy to see a familiar face, especially Colin, but you know, he's all chill about it. Now we just want to briefly talk about Colin here for a second, because despite being a small side character, he does actually kind of have his own little character arc. In the beginning, he's shown as being a bit of a timid kid, getting teased by the other kids, stuff like that. Despite that though, he still looks up to Link, at one point saying he wants to grow up and become strong like Link. He really looks up to the guy. And the reason I bring this up is not just because I really like Colin as a character, but also because of what happens a little later on. The Fused Shadow in this region is located in Death Mountain, but to actually get to the mountain, Link has to leave Kakariko Village for a bit. And when he comes back, well... This leads to a chase between Link and the leader of the monsters. By the way, the game itself never actually gives this guy's name, but supplementary material would reveal it to be King Bulblin. He's the same guy who kidnapped Colin earlier on, and he actually shows up quite a few times throughout the game to get in Link's way, kind of becoming his rival of sorts. For now though, he's recaptured Colin, and after a battle on the bridge, Link knocks Bulblin off his ride all the way into the ravine, and Colin is saved. Now why am I talking about all of this? Well, I'll explain in a minute, but first I need to also bring up a series of events that takes place in the Laneru region. You might have noticed that I didn't mention Ilya at all in that last bit, and that's because despite all the kidnapped children being found in Kakariko, Ilya isn't one of them. So the search for her continues once Link starts making his way through the Laneru region, and while trying to clear the twilight from this area, Link does end up finding her seemingly fine. But again, since she's a spirit, she can't actually see him. Find the light fragments, clear the twilight, there we go. With the region back to normal, Link can finally reunite with Ilya. Let's go. So yeah, it turns out Ilya at some point got herself a bad case of amnesia, having absolutely no recollection of Link at all. And while that sucks, we kind of have bigger things to worry about at this point, so finding a fix for her memory problem is gonna have to wait for now. The big takeaway here is that Link is at least aware that she's alive and well. Now the reason I'm discussing all of this character stuff is because it ends up adding a lot to the pre-established Zelda formula, and to understand what I mean we have to talk about the game that Twilight Princess is usually compared to, Ocarina of Time. 
When comparing both games, Ocarina ends up sharing a lot of structural similarities with Twilight Princess, especially in this first chunk of the game. You start the game in a forest village, go through a forest-themed dungeon, go to Hyrule Field, then to Death Mountain, do a fire-themed dungeon, go to Zora's Domain, do a water-themed dungeon. The way you progress the story at this stage is almost in the exact same order, with a few slight differences, of course. However, the big thing that differentiates the progression here are the characters. Ocarina of Time had plenty of people that Link interacted with, and while plenty of them were distinct and memorable, none of them ended up going through stories of their own. They remained pretty static through the game. I mean, I guess you could count Zelda, but she didn't really change as a person, you know? Well, okay, I guess technically she did, but that's not what I meant. My point is that the individuals in Ocarina of Time never went through any major growth, which is a stark contrast to Twilight Princess. Not everyone's getting their own arc, of course, it's just a few, but the fact that it's happening at all is why I consider the overall characterization of Twilight Princess to be superior in that regard. And that extends to Hyrule itself, as it also feels like an evolution of what Ocarina of Time introduced. Hyrule Field in Ocarina was kind of like a central hub for that game's version of Hyrule, a big field that connected every other area. Now that's still the case with Twilight Princess, but here the field is far bigger than it was previously. And because of its size, there's a lot more to see and a lot more to discover. And that extends to pretty much every other area that Twilight Princess takes from Ocarina. They're all either just as big or usually bigger than how they were in that original Nintendo 64 game. Ocarina of Time introduced this version of Hyrule, but Twilight Princess gives it character. And I think it's just an overall more compelling sense of progression. And speaking of progression... So after traversing the fiery Goron mines and the deep lake bed temple, Link and Minna finally have in their possession all the fused shadows they need. So now it's just a matter of figuring out wherever Zant is. Shouldn't be too hard, right? So Zant pulls a fast one here, ambushing the two, stealing back the fused shadows they collected, and placing a curse on Link, trapping him permanently in his wolf form. He then tries to convince Midna to join his side, being all like, Yo, Hyrule sucks, let's cover it in Twilight. And then Midna's like, No thanks, bro. And then Zant's all like, How dare you! And so sick of Midna's trash talk, Zant tries to have her killed, and is nearly successful until both her and Link are saved by Lanier's light spirit and taken away from Zant. Still though, that attack really does a number on Minna, leaving her on the verge of death, and the Light Spirit tells Link to return to Princess Zelda as quickly as possible, and that leads us to this section. This section of the game is iconic, Wolf Link making a mad dash back to Hyrule Castle with Minna on his back, who herself is just barely hanging on there. You have to work your way through Castle Town, down through the waterways, and back up the sewers to Zelda's tower. All the while, the song Minna's Lament plays in the background, and my god, this is a good track. It really sells the desperation of the situation, and in my opinion, it's one of the best parts of the game, just because of the atmosphere of it all. Link gets Minna back to Zelda, and in her dying breath, she begs Zelda to help Link locate something called the Mirror of Twilight. Zelda immediately goes, Oh hell no, that's your problem, and instead instructs Link to locate the one thing that'll break the curse on him, an all-powerful weapon called the Master Sword. And then, Zelda does this. <laughs> Take 
Lincoln Minna head to the Sacred Grove, a secret region of Farron Woods, and after playing a game of hide-and-seek with this jerk, they make it to the altar of the Sacred Master Sword, which only Link is able to wield. With the Master Sword in their possession, Minna asks Link to help her out again by locating the Mirror of Twilight, an artifact which acts as a gateway to the Twilight Realm, the world where Minna and Zant originally came from, and where Zant has made his base of operations. After doing some digging, the two learn that the Mirror of Twilight is located in the Arbiter's Grounds, an abandoned prison located in the Gerudo Desert. So they travel there and find the Arbiter's Grounds, but not before another battle with King Boblin and his massive axe. They finally arrive at the Mirror Chamber, where Midna is horrified to discover that Zant has already beaten them to it, and has broken the mirror, preventing entry into the Twilight Realm. Then these guys appear, the Ancient Sages, Guardians of the Mirror of Twilight. They give a bit of good news here, explaining that because Zant isn't the true ruler of the Twilight, he wasn't able to destroy the mirror completely. Rather, instead it was split into several pieces, all of which have now been scattered across Hyrule. So the second chunk of the game is pretty similar to the first, where now Link and Minna have to travel to new areas of Hyrule and locate the shattered pieces of the Mirror of Twilight so that they can eventually return to the Twilight Realm and take the fight to Zant directly. Now I think this is the part of the game where a lot of people really started to like Minna as a character, myself included. When you first meet her up until the last few Shadow, Minna's a bit of a snarky asshole, really talking down to Link and treating him more as a servant than a companion. And a part of me thinks that the only reason Link puts up with her at all at this stage is because he really doesn't have a choice, as the both of them need each other's powers to accomplish their own goals. It's after Zelda's sacrifice that Minna starts treating Link more as an actual partner than a tool, and while I don't know if this was intentional, I think there was actually kind of a cool visual metaphor for Minna opening up and being more of a friendly person to Link. You see, Midna is a member of a race of creatures that live in the Twilight, referred to as the Twilight. Because of their affinity for the Twilight, a Twilight can't exist in normal light. Hence why during the hunt for the fused shadows, Midna has to stay hidden in Link's shadow, because she cannot physically handle being in regular light. After Zelda sacrifices her power to revive Minna, she gains the ability to exist in normal light, and it's at this same point where she starts opening up to Link. She is both physically and metaphorically lightening up, and I think that's really cool. Out of all the companions Link has had in the Zelda series, Midna has remained one of the more well-liked, and I absolutely see why. She's a great character, not just with what I've explained so far, but also what's coming up later on. But before we get to that, though, there's a pretty big piece of Twilight Princess I've yet to discuss that really needs to be talked about, especially if we're to understand why this game is as significant as it is when comparing it to the overall Zelda series. <laughs> A major aspect that gives this game its identity comes from its presentation, both in terms of its graphical style and its tone. Visually speaking, this is the only game in the Zelda series where Nintendo would try to go for a realistic interpretation of Hyrule. You compare it to pretty much any other game in the series, and you can see just how far they tried to go with it, and it's especially interesting considering the last console Zelda game before this one was The Wind Waker, a game notable for its heavily cartoonish graphical style. Now that's not me saying that it's trying to look like the Lord of the Rings movies here, because that attempt at realism only goes a certain distance. To a degree, it still retains that fantasy-esque nature to it, just now with a slightly more realistic style to it. And besides, I don't think they were really trying to go as realistic as they possibly could. Again, it's a fantasy, so there's a lot of stuff in here that doesn't exist in our world. And I think trying to make classic Zelda monsters look like they came from the real world would have just become unappealing at a point. Now, going on what we have here, Twilight Princess strikes a nice balance between the realisticness and the cartooniness, and while I think it fits here, I can understand why the series never really continued with this type of art style. Future games like Skyward Sword and Breath of the Wild would continue to present Hyrule in styles that are somewhat realistic, but not to the same degree as it's done here. But why does it work for Twilight Princess? Well, that mainly comes from the game's tone. That being that, just like Majora's Mask tried several years before it, this game has a bit of a dark side to it, and much of it concerns the concept of the Twilight. <laughs> The Twilight in Twilight Princess isn't just an aesthetic choice, it's a legitimate force throughout the game. At many points throughout the adventure, we're reminded of just how dangerous the power of Twilight is in this world. This comes mostly from the bosses, as many of the end of dungeon monsters Link has to fight are creatures that have been corrupted and mutated by the Twilight. 
To show what I mean, the boss of the Goron Mines, for instance, Twilight Igniter Phyrus, is actually the patriarch of the friendly Goron tribe, who was corrupted by the Fused Shadows and mutated into this big monster. The Fused Shadow has to be separated from him so that he can return to his normal size. And if you want a more direct example of how bad the Twilight is, then look no further than the Snow Peak Ruins. Okay, so the hunt for the pieces of the Mirror of Twilight at one point lead Link to the Snow Peak Ruins, an old mansion where inside he meets a couple of friendly yetis. A shard of the mirror is located somewhere in the ruins, and one of the yetis helps guide Link to where the shard is, though it takes a bit given that she doesn't initially remember where the key to the room is. But anyways, they get the key, they get into the room, they find the mirror shard, and the yeti immediately becomes enamored with it, getting a little too obsessed with it, and before Link can grab it... Now don't worry, the Yeti ends up being perfectly fine. Link just slaps her with a ball and chain a few times and she's all better. But the point is, the Twilight is a dangerous force, and the moments like this only accentuate how bad things can get if its influence is allowed to spread. Minda even comments on it herself at one point whilst hunting for the mirror shards. But it isn't just the nature of the Twilight that gives this game a bit of a dark atmosphere, because there are plenty of small moments that can kind of come off as slightly unnerving, these little pieces of a creepier narrative. Hell, this is the only Zelda game to ever get a T rating, so that's gotta say something. Really though, it never turns into like a full-on horror game or anything, it's still a pretty family-friendly experience, just like every other game in this series. It's just those few moments, you know, the kind that... Oh shoot, my controller died. Uh, Alright, just hang on a second. I gotta go find a charging cord for this. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, I'm back. What I miss? 
Right. Yeah. Game's a little creepy, but there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's one of those things I really like about it, as do a lot of people. It's part of why Majora's Mask is so loved within the Zelda community, because it has an atmosphere unlike most others. And being a little bit darker isn't the game's sole identity. Again, it is, by and large, a kid-friendly experience. But the creep factor is just one of the things that help it to stand out from other entries in the series, and I think that's important to take note of. The quest for the Mirror Shards takes Link and Minna all over the place, from the distant Snow Peak Mountains, to the ancient Temple of Time, to the floating city in the sky. And finally, with all the pieces of the Mirror of Twilight reassembled, the pair are able to once again access the Twilight Realm. By the way, you may be wondering, so Zant wasn't able to totally destroy the Mirror originally because he wasn't the true ruler of the Twilight, so if he's not the true ruler, then who is? Well, if you hadn't figured it out by now, then it's here where the ancient sages reveal that Midna is the true ruler of the Twilight Realm, the titular Twilight Princess. In a flashback, we're shown that before the events of the game, Minna was one day overthrown by Zant, who stole her power, transforming her into an imp. Now bereft of her position as a ruler, Minna began formulating her revenge plot, which involved tracking down Link. This whole time, Minna's goal has not been just to get rid of Zant, but also to get her kingdom back, and initially that was her only concern. She didn't really care what happened to Hyrule, so long as she got the Twilight Realm again. But after witnessing the sacrifices that both Link and Zelda have made, she realized that she needed to make sure that both worlds got through this conflict, okay? Link and Minna head to the Twilight Realm, ending up at the Palace of Twilight. And a little side note about this area. So, uh, the main goal here is to get to the Central Palace, but you first have to go through these other two buildings and collect these light orbs, which you then have to return to the palace's central plaza. However, in each room, once you collect one of the light orbs, these floating hands start chasing you and try to get it back. And, like, I really hate both of these segments. They're not, like, difficult or anything, but it's just that these damn hands chasing you always gets my anxiety all worked up. It's the only part of the game that I don't like replaying. But in any case, Link and Minna soon reach the throne room where Zant is waiting for them, and it's here where we learn that Zant is actually an absolute lunatic. Yeah, this whole game he's maintained this stoic, almost boring demeanor. Intimidating for sure, but nothing much else besides that. But here, though, he just lets loose and goes full nut job, and it's like, where was this version of Zant before, you know? I want to see more of this. Anyways, now we gotta fight him, and the boss fight against Zant is probably one of the best fights in the game. The whole gimmick here is that he keeps warping himself and Link to several other arenas from past bosses, and you have to use similar tactics from those bosses to deal damage. It's a fun one, and I like how as the battle goes on, Zant just becomes more and more unhinged, showing just how much this guy has lost it. <laughs> Seriously, look at him go! But with his defeat, Minna gets back the fused shadows, and finally her power is restored. Except nope, not really. Minna is rightfully confused here, and Zant taunts the girl, explaining that so long as his master continues to exist, her power will never return. Yep, that's right, Zant has never actually been doing this alone, as he's been working under someone else this whole time. And his master, the one who's really been pulling the strings this entire time, it's... Ganondorf. Yep, at the 11th hour, we are reintroducing classic villain Ganondorf back into this story, because I guess we just couldn't stick with the new bad guy, could we? Okay, the way I'm phrasing this makes it sound like the Ganondorf twist just kind of comes out of nowhere, and that's how a lot of people frame it, but it really doesn't. It is heavily implied throughout the game that Zant is getting his power from somewhere else besides the Twilight, and after finishing the Arbiter's Grounds, the Ancient Sages just straight up give a flashback showing how Ganondorf fits into the story. Now, for those of you not up to date on your Zelda lore, you're probably wondering, who the hell is this Ganondorf guy? Well, all you really need to know is, he's a jerk who once tried to take over the land of Hyrule using an all-powerful relic called the Triforce. But thanks to the time travel shenanigans of the Link and Zelda from Ocarina of Time, Ganondorf's plan was stopped, and in that flashback were shown that after his evil plan from that game was uncovered, he was sentenced to death, with the sages carrying out his execution. But the gods have a sick sense of humor, I guess, because Ganondorf somehow survived getting stabbed through the chest and began going on a murderous rampage, with the sages, in an act of desperation, using the Mirror of Twilight to banish Ganondorf, sending him to the Twilight Realm. 
In that realm, Ganondorf would come across the desperate and power-hungry Zant, and manipulated the man into believing that Ganondorf was a god. The two then began plotting their takeover of both Hyrule and the Twilight Realm, and while Link and Midna have been dealing with Zant this whole time, Ganondorf has used this opportunity to take full control of Hyrule Castle. And still without her power, and having learned that they have another problem to deal with, Midna gets just a bit angry. So that just leaves one more loose end to tie up, as the two now need to head over to Hyrule Castle and finish off Ganondorf for good, with Midna adding that they might also be able to save Princess Zelda on the way. Somehow. And so, we have our destination set, and I think you know what that means. That's right. It's time to talk about side quests. Outside of the main adventure, there's of course plenty of stuff to do, places to explore, and these mainly come in the form of side quests in minigames, and I actually prefer the way that Twilight Princess handles its side quests as opposed to your standard RPG. Instead of there being a bunch of NPCs that have their own little fetch quests like usual, Twilight Princess instead gives you a few large side quests that you can slowly whittle away at over the course of the game. A lot of them are collection based, where you basically scour the overworld for specific trinkets to complete a larger objective. Like most Zelda games, many of them tend to be pieces of heart, which you can use to expand your total health when you collect a certain amount of them. Weirdly though, unlike every other game where you need to collect four pieces of heart to expand your health, Twilight Princess is the only game in the series where you need to collect five pieces for a new heart, so you know, that's a little weird. One of the more notable side quests, at least to me, is the Golden Bug Collection. So in Castletown you can head over to this one house, and inside you meet Agatha. She's a massive insect enthusiast who gives Link the task of collecting golden bugs. There's 24 of these things scattered around Hyrule, and while you can totally skip them in their entirety, the golden bugs are absolutely something you want to look for when you can, because the rewards for doing so are incredibly helpful. Basically, for every bug you collect, Agatha will give you 50 rupees, 100 for a pair of bugs. Now that's a decent amount by itself, but let's do the math here. You take 24 bugs, factor in how many rupees you get for each one, take out a couple because at two points Agatha will give you a wallet upgrade instead, and the total amount comes out to 1,650 rupees earned for this side quest. So yeah, it's definitely something you want to work on because you can make absolute bank with Agatha, and all these rupees really help out for another major side quest the Mallow Mart. Okay, so while in Kakariko, one of the Ordon kids decides to open up their own shop, and after a while they start a fundraiser to open up another shop in Castle Town. You have to donate 1,000 rupees for the fundraiser, which really isn't that hard of a goal to accomplish, and after helping out a Goron in another 200 rupee donation, you gain access to the Mallow Mart. It's a bit of a lengthy side quest, but you still might want to try completing it, because the Malomar is the only shop in the game where you can buy the unique magic armor. And let me tell you, the magic armor isn't actually that great. You're invincible while wearing it, but instead it eats up your rupees, not just for every second you wear it, but also when you get hit, where you lose even more rupees. I mean, by this point you probably won't have much left to spend your money on, but still, it's not a piece of armor I like using. By the way, around the end of the game is when Link finally gets around to trying to fix Ilya's amnesia problem, which itself is kind of this annoying back and forth between these two areas. Still though, the result of this segment is Link restoring Ilya's memories, but the funny thing is that you're not actually required to cure her amnesia. You have to do most of this segment for story progression, but it is possible to skip over a couple steps and just never get her memories back, which is kind of funny in how cruel that is. I mean, you really should cure her amnesia, just because doing so gets you a really handy item, but still, the fact that you can go the whole game without getting Ilya's memories back is just kind of funny to me. Aside from that though, there really is just a lot of small stuff to keep you busy. Finding upgrades for your items, collecting postals, snowboarding, fishing, that chicken game at Lake Hylia, the Cave of Ordeals, a 50 floor enemy gauntlet with some of the hardest fights in the game. You are absolutely getting your money's worth with Twilight Princess. And like, I'm not a completionist, you know, like I'll try to do as much as I possibly can with any game, but usually only on my first playthrough. But for some reason, every single time I replay Twilight Princess, I feel like I need to collect as much as I possibly can. Not because I feel like I need to, but because it's just fun to do so. But, okay, I think I've gushed about this game for long enough. Ganondorf is waiting in Hyrule Castle, so let's just go and finish this.
Now, for a while now, Hyrule Castle has been protected by this massive twilight force field, so that has to go down first. And here we get a really good taste of the power of the fused shadows, as when Midna tries to use them, they cause her to transform into a giant spider monster that just goes nuts, instantly destroys the barrier, and allows the two of them to get to the castle grounds. The first part of this final area is outside the castle. The front doors are locked, so you need to find a key to get inside. I like how there's no music here, just the ambient sound of rain. It really sets a good atmosphere. But yeah, the key to the castle ends up being guarded by good old King Bulblin, meaning Link and him have to have one final confrontation. Of course Link wins here, and the end of the battle is a little bit interesting, because instead of just dying already, Bulblin smirks and just straight up hands Link the key. Well, all right then, let's head inside. Hyrule Castle is quiet when you enter, almost unnervingly quiet. The music in here is a melancholic rendition of the classic Hyrule Castle theme. It's similar to many other Zelda games where the music for their respective final area is usually slower and simple, not exactly grand in their composition, but still emphasizing the journey you've had or the evil you're about to face off against. But here, in this segment, it's just simple and quiet. The enemies you fight here are a lot of the different varieties you've fought over the course of the game, the biggest one being these large knights called Dark Nuts. You have to fight like five of these guys, but at this point you should be good enough at the combat, where they aren't that difficult to take down. Link ascends up through the castle, working his way to the throne room, and this is when the music begins to swell, gradually shifting from the castle theme to Ganondorf's theme, and at the very top of the castle, Link and Midna arrive at the throne room, where Ganondorf sits on the throne waiting for them. Oh yeah, Zelda's here too. No idea how, considering what happened to her the last time we saw her, but here she is. I, whatever, just go with it. Ganondorf flaunts his power for a bit, and basically just acts like a jerk before actually doing something, possessing Zelda's body before Midna can bring her back to life. So here we go, the first phase of the final boss. And if you've played Ocarina of Time before, then the method to take down Ganondorf here might seem a little familiar. At some point in the fight, Ganondorf will shoot this energy ball at you, and all you really have to do is swat it away in a quick game of tennis. Do that three times and Ganondorf becomes stunned long enough for Midna to purge Zelda's body of him. Immediately after, though, Ganondorf mutates into his next form, Dark Beast Ganon. For this phase, you're supposed to switch to Wolf Link, his beast form versus Ganondorf's beast form. And the cool thing about this fight is that it's the only battle where Midna directly helps Link out. You kind of have to wait for Ganon to charge at you here, at which point Midna will grab him by the head and toss him to the side like he ain't no thing. And then Link just goes to town on his stomach. Another great fight, and the music here kicks ass. But despite losing again, Ganondorf just won't go down, so Midna decides it's time to use the power of the fused shadows on him, warping Link and Zelda away in the process while she stays behind. The two reappear in the middle of Hyrule Field and watch as a large explosion engulfs the castle, leaving Midna's fate uncertain.
Link and Zelda briefly retreat to, I don't know, the astral plane, where Zelda gives Link the Bow of Light, a powerful weapon capable of vanquishing evil. The third phase of this boss has Link and Zelda riding around on his horse against Ganondorf. You have to catch up to him and keep him within distance while Zelda hits him with the bow. Or, you know, tries to anyway. Not that bad, but it's kind of annoying trying to keep Ganondorf in range, especially when he turns right around and just knocks Link off his horse. But eventually they strike Ganondorf enough and he falls from his horse, leading to the final phase of the fight, a one-on-one -on -one duel between Link and Ganondorf. Now the atmosphere here is so awesome, and the fight utilizes most of the sword skills you've learned up to this point. Easily, it's one of the best Link vs. Ganondorf fights in the franchise. And a little detail I like is that Ganondorf's sword here is the same one that the sages used for his execution as shown in the flashback. Now that's a neat touch. But Link gets the upper hand and plows the Master Sword right through his chest. And while Ganondorf gets right back up, things don't exactly go like last time. In the distance, Link then notices Midna hanging out on a hill with all the light spirits for some reason, and all excited he runs up to her, finding that at last Midna's power is restored, and she's been returned to her true twilight form. And yeah, you know, that's pretty cool. I think that in the years since the release of Twilight Princess, its significance in the context of the overall series has gotten all the more interesting. This game was released at a point in the franchise where the series seemed almost committed to a single style. The two games released before this one were The Wind Waker and Four Swords Adventures, and the two games released afterwards were Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks. All of them used the same type of style, which we typically refer to as Toon Link. It wouldn't be until 2011, five years after Twilight Princess, where the series would finally break from the Toon Link style. And I'm saying this because it makes Twilight Princess seem kind of like an anomaly. Like, clearly that game's style didn't work out so well, so they just went right back to a style that worked before and stuck with that for a while. And in that sense, it almost makes it sound like this game didn't resonate with audiences quite so well, but I don't think that's the case, as the game's legacy managed to leave a rather large mark on the franchise going forward. The iteration of Link, Zelda, and Ganondorf presented here would end up being the designs they'd be depicted with in two Smash Brothers games. The big crossover game, Hyrule Warriors, included Midna, Zant, and Agatha in that game's plot as major characters. And of course, we can't forget about the classic Twilight Princess Picross, now available for your Nintendo 3DS. I have no idea what I'm doing. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess has a bit of a reputation in the Zelda community as being a bit of a rehash of Ocarina of Time, and like I said before, there is merit in that argument, especially in the game's first several hours, but as it goes on, it begins to distance itself from the formula of Ocarina and carves out an identity that is very much its own, and maybe it's because of that similarity in its opening hours that kind of came off as a disappointment to some people when they first played it. A lot of people don't really care for this game, but at the same time, plenty more of them do, and I'm glad that the game gets the amount of appreciation that it does, and I hope I've been able to demonstrate that over the last 49 minutes, because there is a lot to like about it. As for me, well, it might be obvious by now, but I love this game. It's my favorite Zelda game in the series, it's one of my favorite Nintendo games ever made, it's one of my favorite games ever made. And to show just how much I love this game, I own three versions of it, one for every console it's ever come out on, and if it ever gets a re-release in the future, you can bet that I will pick it up as soon as possible. Everything I've described is why I consider Twilight Princess as classic 3D Zelda perfected. It takes the characters and gives them stories. It takes the world and gives it depth. 
Both of these games have epic feels to them, but I think Twilight Princess is where they really got it right. Of course, the advance in technology most definitely had something to do with it, given that they could do things with the newer game that they couldn't with the old. Now, I don't want to make this sound like Ocarina is like a bad game or anything, far from it, and if you prefer Ocarina to Twilight Princess, then that's perfectly fine. But for me personally, I think this game does far more to create a fulfilling experience, and it's done in such a way that I really don't think it'll ever be done again by Nintendo. But then again, I don't really want them to. The further Nintendo travels away from the direction Twilight Princess went in will just make this game a lot more special. And at the end of the day, that's kind of what I've been trying to showcase here. It's special. And I'll always love it for that. Ha <laughs> ha! 